Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, hour number three, which, of course, is our preparedness, civil defense, and earth changes hour. We cover pretty well everything that's important in terms of survival, of uh, you know, understanding what's going on in your world. We've got an important report. If John, if you're able to make it, I know you had a lot of things going on. John, can you give I'm us a here. brief report on what happened? Because I, I got somebody emailing me a portion of an MP3, which I couldn't upload. But I know we've talked about this over the years, that you have a, a tapping of knowledge from your sources that there are elements of the continuity of government that have received information about an incoming object to our solar system right. and have been told that this could impact on our continuity of government. And we know that the two primary things that an incoming object, because it's not going to come within 55 million miles of Earth, this uh, they call it the Planet X, or the better term would be a dwarf star, most likely a Class three red dwarf, not a brown dwarf star, but a red dwarf star, because it's releasing radiation in the infrared and the X-ray bands, which are picked up by the IRAS telescope and other telescopes that are consortiums of international uh, cooperative research going on with the Pi Meson telescope uh, under the ice sheet in Antarctica and also in other countries. It, it, there's been a uh, astronomer actually come on air in Brazil. It's well known that said that now they can see it. I mean, there's no doubt that there's an object in, in our solar system that comes back every 3,600 plus years, that this object can cause gravitational waves, it can affect earthquakes and volcanoes, and it can cause coronal mass ejections, and we're moving into solar cycle 24 by next year, we're going to see some major CMEs, there's one actually heading toward Earth as we speak, that's actually holocentric, which means it's actually a direct, it's going to be a direct hit, and we don't know how bad the damage will be, because it's an X, it's a lower X class, which is the highest class of radiation, but it's a lower part of that scale, uh, it could potentially cause ground radiation, tell your occurrence. It could blow power generators, power lines, and affect uh, ground level communications and satellites. And our civilization couldn't stand a Harrington event, 1859 again, because if it happened in our day and age, our civilization would screech to a halt with no gasoline pumped, no cars delivering food, no trucks, uh, no freeway activity, no lights, no internet, no communications uh, by telephone or whatever, any other means. Uh, we would have some real serious problems almost immediately. Well, it would be instantaneous, Dr. Bill. Here's what's going on. Uh, the uh, dependence of people in the military who are considered part of the continuity of government contingency planning, which is a tiny, tiny part of the U.S. military, maybe maybe 2 or 3 percent, right. are getting briefings uh, that they need to be on a standby. They may get as much as two weeks' notice. They may not get that much to pack up a carry-on bag, one bag of luggage, and abandon all their other personal property, clothing, appliances, furniture, and uh, get out of Dodge. Uh, these briefings began last week, um, and um, my contacts will uh, alert me when uh, this thing goes down. We, we're expecting any time between now and possibly the 1st of November. Uh, these briefings would not be conducted six months or eight months in advance. Uh, anywhere from one month to three or four months at the most. Yeah, for my sources, I uh, mentioned this their program. A lot of people are very skeptical. Oh, Diggle, you're just making it up. Just like they said, I was making it up about the RFID chip that was approved six months before the Affordable Care Act two and a half years ago by Sibelius from Health and Human Services, and that incorporated as a Class two device in the people that are opted in in the Obamacare program, all children and every adult, and also not only that, forced, quote, mandatory vaccinations for adults. And that, that could be up to 50-plus vaccines. I mean, people don't understand just how crazy things are. And also, the government's fully aware of this. In fact, the fact that they're not allowing the population to be aware and to start doing civil defense, because the government, including FEMA, doesn't really have any resources. They just manage the resources that are in place. So that's, right. that's not. So we need to have deputized people. We need to have people with personal resources. We need to have alternative power supplies. I even, when I contacted after the September 8th problem last year, the local authorities here in Southern California to find out here or in not only across America but in any country, virtually every country has backup power for pumping water. But nobody, and I haven't found any country or any place yet in America, Canada, or anywhere, has backup power generators for treating sewage. So after well, four days on average... Without the other. <laughs> right, so after four days they have to shut off the water, not because they can't pump, because they have backup power generators for the fire department and for the cities and towns across America and elsewhere. They don't have backup power supplies for treat the sewage, so they have to shut off the water. Now, well, four days without water and your Liverpool protocol, you're dead. Well, the reason for this, Dr. Bill, the, the uh, fire departments and fire districts uh, are the ones that made sure there was power for the water. And... The, 
the fire districts really don't care about sewage. It's really not their interest. They want to make right. sure they can put out fires. Right. Yeah. Now, the other thing is the, the power supplies are more and more fragile. And our systems, by the way, when we now have gone to the smart grid, makes it easier for the Blue Army in China to actually hack in and destroy our power grid. And we're, we're in a sense, in a technical economic phase of a world war against China and Russia right now. This is not a maybe. This is already happening. That war, in a sense, the war warning shot was September 11th, 2001. We're in the 11th year, and I expect this year the self-inflicted wound of the debt monster they've unleashed that will destroy Europe and form a federated Europe is the move toward a, a grab for powerful global government. And they don't mind if they release a plague in the time or they don't deal with Fukushima because now we've got resistant rubella and resistant TB showing up in Japan because we have a weakened population. And people think, oh, no, Dr. Deagle, it's all made up. We're not going to have a plague of H5N1, H1N1. I have the documents. 1997, 15 years ago, March 16th, I got them right from Zurich, from the World Health Organization headquarters in Basel, given to me by scientists and doctors in a private meeting who gave me the documents. The WHO were directly planning this. They actually made the AIDS virus. They had a vaccine that they've been sued internationally regarding to stop pregnancy in the human chorionic and anatropin. The World Health Organization, these globalists, are mass murderers. And people say, Dr. Deagle, that's just an exaggeration. It's, it's a conspiracy theory. It's a way to besmirch my name to say this. And I'm, saying, I'm not saying this because it's nice. I'm saying it because we could stop it. If we just had a tiny portion of even the population wake up and say, you know, I think that Deagle may be telling the truth. And I mean senators and congressmen. I have had now a month of harassing Senator Wyden and getting nowhere. So now I started calling Senator Dianne Feinstein regarding what happened at Fukushima. And I expect within the next few weeks, maybe months, a major burp of radiation from Japan, and we're not going to have any advance warning whether it's an air flight that goes through a giant radioactive plume or radiation brought to ground by rain or just by air masses that brings it to ground even in broad daylight without rain. We have no advance warning that we're going to have a major radiation burp that's going to hit our populations. And people are, the doctors are not trained in environmental medicine to pick up subacute radiation sickness. They're not going to have any idea when people start brushing their teeth and bleeding, getting disoriented in vertigo, getting vomiting, having all kinds of problems with bloody diarrhea, difficulty with weird infections showing up all of a sudden, uh, people hair acting, falling out, right. hair falling out, decorting, right. breaking out, and ulcers and sores all over their body like they had a sunburn, but there's no sun. Uh, the doctors are not trained, okay? They're not going to know no. how to pick this up. They're like they're, no. you know, I don't think anybody should be practicing medicine or nursing or any health profession, including chiropractic or naturopathy, unless they have some additional training in environmental medicine and civil defense. I think it's an obscenity that doctors in the 21st century don't know more environmental medicine. And I've mentioned that with Dr. William Ray. I think it should be a, a requirement of medical school, chiropractic, naturopathy, and any, quote, helping profession that thinks that they know and we need those kind of training things, too, for policemen and firefighters because they're going to be involved with the local dealing with an environmental disaster because we're going to have them. So, Absolutely. Well, they so, should. You know, most of these doctors, Dr. Bill, would spend a 40-year career and, and never see anything related to radiation in their entire career. So it's Well, they won't recognize them. You, you, yeah, listen, I worked in central Illinois. And I was the director of the of the uh, occupational environmental clinic at the Pekin Hospital. And we had a, the one of the largest nuclear reactors in the United States was one of our clients. And I can tell you, the local doctors didn't have the faintest clue how to recognize radiation sickness. If they had a worker that was exposed to radioactive uh, uh, releases inside the reactor site, they had no idea how to diagnose them. They had no idea even how to look at their peripheral blood smear, what cell type changes would occur, what kinds of symptoms people would pre present with the CNS or otherwise. They didn't have the faintest clue. Doesn't surprise me. Yeah, not even Doesn't the faintest clue. Me. Yeah. Um, Anne, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, when we come back, I want to hear an update on what's going on with the CME that's incoming. We have a holocentric direct hit on, a, on the world that's coming in from the sun, and it's an X-class. And we want to tie this all together because we expect that the big thing that's going to happen besides the earthquakes and volcanoes from the gravity waves of this object in our solar system is a what's called a kill shot, which I expect to happen in the next, let's say, years that will have a major effect on our planet.
Welcome back. And uh, and what's happening with this holocentric uh, CME? We have uh, repeated ones, big ones. Last time, was about a week or two ago, was a was a uh, less than X class, an M class. This is an X, I think, 1.0 class, but it's actually direct hit toward the Earth. Uh, where is it likely to strike and what consequences might happen? Again, this is a warning shot that tells us that as we get into more and more energetic uh, kill shots, we're likely to have degradation of our power grid, degradation of satellites for satellite communication and Internet, which reports all business. Uh, the level of uh, radiation also can affect behavior of humans because the magnetic field affects the transcortical membrane of your brain. Uh, and uh, the tellurate currents we know were the things that cause the release of the of the the the, the flies the the gnats and the uh, frogs that occurred even at the plagues of ancient Egypt. We know the tellurate currents, even uh, cataloged by the ancient Greeks during the passage of near planets like uh, like Venus that, uh, and Mars that caused major transfer across interstellar space, caused the release of. Uh, Pests deep in the ground caused by these currents, caused by interplanetary plasma discharges. Well, they are, they are seeing red cockroaches over in Singapore. And uh, they, <laughs> the uh, government says, well, they'll go away. But I saw those on a red news, Red cockroaches? No. What, yeah. no is, this a, is this a new color or what, is it mutating or what's happening? <laughs> and, uh, I have no idea, Dr. Bill. But, uh, yeah, we did have a uh, flare from um, AR1520, and AR1520 is in the middle of the solar disk. And uh, when you have a, a region, sunspot region, that's in the middle of the solar disk, then uh, anything that comes out of that region will be um, Earth-oriented. In other words, it will be coming towards the Earth. <laughs> it won't be... It won't just be uh, on the side of the Earth. It'll come directly at us. And they've already had, uh, this This was a very strange uh, flare. It was an X1.4. Now, the Carrington event, they think, was an X54. Uh-huh. And remember, they were talking about a logarithmic scale. Right. So uh, we're talking multiples of 100. Um, but we do know from the Carrington event that an X54 is possible. And it could be possible um, the sunspot spot cycle in the next, either this year or next year or, or the year after that. Right, and, and we're case, in that danger was, zone. We're in that danger zone for the next uh, three years. And uh, what happened was that uh, they it emitted, uh, the, the, they they emitted they they strobed a um, pulse of extreme ultraviolet radiation. So we first we had the electrons, and the electrons uh, uh, hit the Earth and, and went down the, the magnetic lines of force. And then we had a strobe, like I said, of ultraviolet. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot of people with sunburns because yeah, that ultraviolet man. is coming through the atmosphere now. And now, uh, People need to realize that the weaker frequencies like A will tan you, B will burn you. C will actually cause cancer. It can actually go through objects like clothing. D is so powerful, it even goes through the side of a building. People don't understand that ultraviolet light is not just a minor thing. The D means death. And uh, cosmic background radiation, a lot of it, when you see the sun during the day, uh, there's a time if the ozone layer was gone and you went out during the day with the sun's radiation, it would kill you. You would not be able to go out during the day if the sun was not shielded by the ozone layer. So uh, after that, and the uh, the protons, of course, the protons are what seven thousand times heavier than the electrons, yeah. which is why they come in uh, afterwards, and they charged up the atmosphere, and they even had auroras around the South Pole. Now that is very very unusual, but they wow. have pictures of them up on spaceweather.com. So that's how uh, strong the proton storm was. Uh, although they only mention it at an S1, uh, solar storm level 1, and they go up to a 5. So the, it's possible that it could go higher. They're still watching it, but so far it's still at an S1. Now, in addition, it unleashed a CME, and that's a coronal mass ejection. A coronal right. mass ejection is a cloud that is very complicated and very compact magnetic lines of force. It doesn't, it's not a... It's not an electrical magnetic force. It's a, uh, uh, it's just magnetic. So it involves yeah. our our uh, magnetosphere, which right. you know it goes in at the North Pole, comes out at the South Pole, and circles around the Earth. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. 
You can actually push it, push it into the earth and push it out the other side as well. When those kind of forces come in, they actually push it like a balloon being pushed through the water. It pushes it down toward the surface of the earth and pushes the magnetic flux field of the earth and the lines of force out into space on the opposite side of the planet. Yeah, on the dark side. Yeah. And as it turns out, we've had a fairly strong IMF, and that's an interplanetary magnetic force. And you see uh, an IMF... Oh. When the sun, for instance, is trying to align its magnetic field with, with a planet's magnetic field, or when a planet is trying to align its magnetic field with one of its moons. So they know about the IMF, and in our case, the Earth with the sun, it uh, flips direction eight, every eight days. So that means that if we were to align our, <clears throat> our magnetosphere with the sun's, our magnetosphere would be flipping from north to south every eight days. Wow. All right, let's not, that's, that's, that's bad to think about. Yeah, anyway, the coronal mass ejection, now they've, they've updated. The, the, it, they think that it's, it's coming in faster than they thought, and they think that it's going to come in about the uh, 14th, that's Saturday, about uh, 9 UT, so you subtract 5 to get to central time, and 9 minus 5 is 4. So at 4 a.m., uh, tomorrow morning, it will be hitting the Earth, and then it will continue to hit the Earth. You have to understand this cloud is bigger than the Earth, much bigger than the Earth. And so it will continue to hit the Earth as the Earth turns. And so just because it hits at, let's say, 4 a.m., <laughs> that doesn't mean that it's, that's all there is. It's not a strobe. It's a continuous uh, beam of magnetism. And you're right, it'll push the magnetosphere towards the Earth on the sunlit side and away from the Earth on the sun, on the uh, dark side. Now, on the dark side, you, you'd think you wouldn't have any impacts from that. But as it turns out, when the magnetosphere is stretched out on the dark side, the electrons that circle the magnetic lines of force are pulled back towards the Earth, and they actually accelerate back towards the Earth. There's an acceleration of the electrons back towards the Earth. So you do get electrical effects on the dark side of the Earth. On the, yeah, the, on the, the other thing is if you're flying at low altitude, during a CME where the magnetic flux field of the Earth is pushed in deeply, you can actually be flying at thirty to 40,000 feet and you're actually above the magnetosphere of the Earth or low Earth orbit satellites. And these satellites can get fried because of cosmic background radiation. You can get a major increase in even space-based radiation, even if you're at altitude. So the NOAA posted this in 2007, and I talked about it when I sent my information to Dr. Senator Wyden, that there's a certain amount of background solar and, and cosmic radiation, but when you're flying at altitudes when there's a CME, that might be 10 or 20 or 30 times higher radiation. That's why your okay, astronauts well, during a CME have to go inside special chambers of the International Space Station so they don't get cooked. Well, that's right, but this is still just an S-1, and so they don't think that it's going to do that. On the, yeah. on the bright side of the Earth, what can happen is you can have surges in the power lines, and you can have ground currents. The ground currents will take out the emergency diesel generators at nuclear power plants and other power plants. And uh, the line currents will take out your electrical equipment. So if tomorrow uh, you miss uh, you know, your, elect your television quits, uh, you should have had it on a UPS. Welcome back, and Ann, you've got some major information about this asteroid that's been watched for three years. 2012 DA-14, 175 foot, which can take out 800 square miles. It's got a greater than 1% chance of an impact on the Earth in the next uh, period of time. How? When do they expect the passage of the Earth? What, what date do they expect it to pass? Yeah, they, they've already figured that out, and that would be February 16th. 2013. So we're. Isn't that interesting? Birthday. The day after my birthday. So, it, <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, February 15th is my birthday. I was born midnight Valentine's. Anyway, this asteroid is not one that's in the asteroid belt. This is an asteroid that came into the solar system. And yeah, from the Oort cloud. Uh, it's an Oort cloud. So it might be. You mentioned something that John mentioned. Can you tell us about that? Uh, well, he thinks that it could be part of the. Uh, of the uh, of the scraps that follow the plant, the Nibiru planet. Yeah, in other words, it's around. orbital de debris that's around the the uh, red dwarf star that's coming into our solar system. So the, the, this one may be a small one. 
because it would yeah. be further out from the from the red sun. Right. But, uh, so the next ones that come in, I mean, this won't be the only one. It's got right. a lot of objects around it, and the heavier objects will be closer to it, so right. they'll be bigger. So this one is big enough, though. This one would wipe out um, an area the size of the country of Luxembourg in uh, in the Eurozone, European. Yeah. Yeah. So if it hits land, that's what it would do. It would wipe out. Now, the last one that hit was the one in Siberia that hit in 1908. And it hit up in Siberia. There, wasn't, there weren't many people living there. But we still can see the effects of it because it, it, it just all the trees fell down. I mean, you can tell that something hit, and there was a huge explosion because all the trees around it, uh, the size of the state of, I mean, of the country of Luxembourg, are all flat. I mean, the right. whole la the landscape is flat. Yeah. So that's what it would do. If, of course, if it hit near a population center, you know, that would be a disaster. But it would be worse if it hits in the ocean. And the reason it would be worse if it hits in the ocean is because, <laughs> one, it would c cause a tsunami, probably. Right. And uh, depending on where it hit, there would be coastlines that would be wiped out. But the impact will act would actually cause water vapor to go into the air. I mean, there's so much kinetic energy. This thing is 197 feet long, or 79 feet long. Yeah, so... And so it, uh, it's huge. Uh, and uh, there would be enough kinetic energy, even if it broke in two. Yeah, that, absolutely. Uh, so that, that that's really interesting. Vapor, yeah, that's really interesting. And then so we, we might have an impact winter. Exactly. An impact winter would mean that there would the, the amount no of... No crops. Energy, yeah, would very high energy, energy, ultraviolet light, and it would be dangerous during the day especially. Plus, we'd have a failure of all crops around the world. Well, not only that, you'd have incessant rains. You'd have major flooding all over. Wow. Yeah. yeah. We know what that's like in California. We have mudslides. We have uh, Chris Harris here and uh, oh, good. Uh, and, and uh, Robert Felix. Uh, Chris, I, I understand you gave us a little bit of updates. Uh, to give us the latest, I, I've got the emails here that will be posted up right after the show. You have a couple of reports about the 20 senior officials from the Korean hydronuclear power arrested for corruption. You've got an updated report on uh, uh, issue what's going on with uh, Fukushima uh, in terms of the uh, lots of things going on. Can you give us some, the kind of the summary of what's happening and how serious it is? Okay, station blackout is what one of the major things that did Fukushima, and it turns out that in Korea, one of the largest plants in the world is the Quarry Unit One. Had, had actually, for 12 minutes, a real station blackout when their diesels were not working and the off-site power didn't work. And recently, that was in January, January of this year, and there was a big management cover-up, and now it looks like these managers, uh, I can't remember whether 13 or 16 of them are being sent to prison over that, and that's, that's exactly what needs to happen. Yeah, the Koreans are much more uh, serious in, in terms of taking this seriously than the Japanese. Uh, they, they've got radiation detectors in the fish counters in their grocery stores. They don't, they're don't. they not messing around with this at all, are they? No, it seems like... Uh, but I, I'm really, I was kind of surprised, shocked, and uh, I'm really dismayed that the industry uh, is uh, lacking... We, we talk about the adult readership and the, uh, the lack thereof, and... Uh, the regulator you can't count on them to do anything more. Well, than we haven't heard eyewash. of so we yeah. haven't heard more than eyewash from the, the replacement of Jasco. Who's the new regulator for the uh, oh, nuclear McFarlane. industry? What's her name? McFarlane. McFarlane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she's apparently a geologist, and and from what I hear so far, there's no rulemaking. There's no kind of cracking the whip. Uh, nothing's happened. Jasco was trying to actually crack the whip that you can't restart these reactors. You have to move, turn off reactors, and better backup power systems. They deal with extreme weather. They're not prepared for anything. If we have extreme weather this year, which we now expect to be a very extreme summer for a very, very crazy weather with the heat we've had the last few weeks across America, we're likely to see many tornadoes and extreme weather. They're likely to cause more station blackouts, more flooding, more danger to our nuclear facilities across America. Yeah, well, one word on McFarlane. Uh, the word is happy days are here again. I think uh, Jasco was more like a real scientist and he was trying to do something. And if the industry wasn't going to take care of us, I'd rather I take. I'd rather we take care of ourselves. To be honest with you, I don't want to have a regular. I don't like police looking at me. I don't like that. Right. I want to be able to be mature enough to handle it and, and 
step up to the plate and be adult about it and handle it ourselves. But uh, so now, now that's what happens when you got somebody up there who's trying to do, you know, trying to uh, whip them into shape. And now uh, it looks like, uh, well, that's what happens. You get uh, you get ousted. So right. well, let's we'll see what happens. What what uh, what else is happening? And uh, Robert Felix, what what else is happening in terms of the ice age that's happening? We're we're seeing uh, crop failures everywhere, Argentina and and Chile and Peru. We're seeing uh, now crop failures of the corn in America, extreme drought, uh, extreme heat now across the Soviet Union. I still call it Soviet Union because as far as I'm concerned, it never ended. Uh, and Russia and all these other countries, the Eastern Bloc, uh, things are really not good. I mean, the second largest wheat producer, Russia, is going to have a major destruction of their cr- uh, crop if everything continues the way it is now this summer. Uh, what's happening? Well, a big one that I'm not seeing in the United States media, but what it has published been published uh, overseas. There's a new finding out that the Earth has been cooling for the last 2,000 years. And it it just thoroughly debunks the claim that the temperatures on the planet today are any way historic or unprecedented. This is a study that was a a new study of tree ring data, and they have taken measurements back to 138 B.C., and they show that the Earth is slowly cooling. And they have, I I have a... uh, um, graph on on my website showing that downward trend for the last 2000 years this particular graph shows the roman uh Medi- the roman warm period when it was warmer than it is today it shows a migration period when when it was colder and that so the people migrated then it shows the medieval warm period and it shows a little ice age and it shows today and it's just you can just see that trend line going down and down and down but uh uh, you know, the United States media is just not reporting on that. Some of, some of the other things that, uh, that, I've, that I've got, uh, Arctic supply ships today are stuck in what this, uh, the Alaska dispatch calls brutal Bering Sea ice. Now, that, that's another one that, that, uh, that you probably haven't, haven't heard of lately, but uh, it, just, it just came out that... Uh, the ice is so thick that it's closing in around the icebreakers before other ships can follow. So th- these brutal sea ice conditions that northwest Alaska battled all winter. I know that, you know, southern, you know, the, the mainland United States, the continental United States has, has been warmer. But uh, Alaska, we got to remember, Alaska is part of the United States. And these re- resupply ships, I mean, this is the middle of July. And the Canadian icebreakers aren't able to keep up with it. Yeah, in so. fact, I was watching uh, some of these shows that are on the, you know, Discovery channels and History channels about the Arctic ice. In the last three years, the ice has been advancing more than any other time in recorded history yes. along the Arctic Ocean. Yes. Yeah, and for, even though for those people who are wondering, well, why is it so hot in the Midwest in the southern United States? That's because of the drilling at the Macondo British Petroleum site two years ago, which caused the destruction of the loop currents. And all that heat's been trapped there in the Gulf and pumping up into the America. So extremes in climate are the standard now. And uh, and I didn't realize that sometimes you've got quite a uh, sense of humor when you gave this report about asteroid twenty twelve DA fourteen, which is a four on the Torino scale. You also gave a recommendation for buy a couple of rabbits as pets for your kids this year and learn how to set up a rabbit hutch or a worm farm. Uh, be prepared to move into the this into the basement and spare room if your impact winter comes. Uh, people don't realize that. Climate change is something that the government expects to happen, and they're trying to get their new world order and their global control grid in place long before all hell breaks loose. Hey, That's I why they're in such a panic. That was not, that was not humorous. That's a I know that. I, I know it wasn't humorous. I know it was a real suggestion, but I wanted to kind of put a little spin on it to make it look like it's humorous. But, in fact, people say, well, why do you do this last hour on Fridays and talk about horrifying things like you're talking about all the wellness and everything. Look, if you're taking nutraceuticals like a radiation protocol, you're taking nutraceuticals to protect yourself, you've got your food, you've got ageless life support, glycemics, and NutriComplete, you're ready with your water and your guns and everything, you're going to be fine. Uh, most likely what we're going to have is something where the power grid get, gets knocked out, a good portion of the population goes crazy, we'll have civil defense by our militia, we'll finally get our act together. Uh, people will be deputized by the hundreds of thousands, say, here in California, 
And every city in town, and I know this from working with the government, within four to 12 days will be completely controlled by either gangs or civil militia. The military is not even part of the equation. They're going to be protecting the powers that be in a continuity government because they're such a tiny force compared to the size of our actual armed population. There's enough military armaments and power in the civilian population of the United States that if they assembled every army of every nation on earth, they could not take on the American public. That's a fact. And the fact is that only the American public could defend itself from from gangs armed to the teeth because there are so many of them. Uh, when I was in Denver back in the uh, late 90s and up to 2004 when I lived there, we had over 2,200 gangs just in a little city like Denver, which is 2.6 million people. I live in Southern California where we have 26 million people, 10 times that population. And you can take that number and add at least one more zero, so around 22,000 gangs. And some of these gangs are not little gangs, they're big gangs, too. And they're armed to the teeth. Many of them have military skills, uh, you know, high-speed uh, motorcycles, all kinds of weapon systems and tactics. They've actually, often they're ex-military. Uh, people need to be prepared for the fact that uh, real things are going to happen, whether they like it or not. And something as simple as the power went out. I remember talking to people at the local Alberts in the September 8th last year, and people were having fist fights in the aisles looking, fighting for ice. So their food wouldn't rot in their house. Well, we've got a 20 kilowatt generator. I'm putting on lithium pyrophosphate batteries. We're going to have more experts talking on the show regarding that. You want to have alternative water recovery. I put a water recovery system on our roof for recovering water. If you have the ability to put in a well, put in a well. Be prepared to also have extra so you can help your neighbors and friends and inspire them to have self-protection, have guns, have other non-gun things so they can protect themselves and have uh, skill sets so they know what to do to protect themselves and to grow food. Uh, I happen to be out in the country in North County, San Diego, but I tell people, if you're in a big city, get the heck out now. Move. Do not be in any big city from this point onward. If you have to move so many miles out and, try and commute in, do it. But do not live in any big city. Live on the outskirts. Live close enough you can get yourself out of there. And if things look really bad, you have to have a plan to be able to bug out long distance. Uh, right now, to me, my bug out is here. Uh, I don't plan on bugging out further. I believe that we're far enough away from anything that uh, <laughs> if anybody tries to cause trouble, we have so many Marines per square yard here in North County, San Diego. We have a standing army here. So your comments, Ann. Yeah, well, what I was saying was that if this asteroid 2012 a, uh, DA-14 were to hit, and if it were, if the impact were great enough, then we might have an what they call an impact winter. And in that case, you won't have UV coming down to the Earth. You, the, you won't be able to grow food, and the animals and plants that are on the surface of the Earth will die. There'll be a mass die-out. Right. And uh, so you, what you need, and what I had recommended in the note that I sent out to you, was that uh, people put in a system of UV lights and... Uh, and get a couple of rabbits of the right genders, and don't tell the pet store owner what you're doing, because you may end up slaughtering these animals just to survive. And uh, then the worms go underneath the rabbits, and the rabbit droppings are not so, they, they're not as odiferous, and the worms will eat them and turn them into soil. So what you do is you, is you have a worm pin underneath the rabbit pin, and uh, you could set that up in a spare bedroom, and then you let them mate, and then you would have constant at least meat for a while. You'd have to have a UV light though, on them. Yeah. Now, people need to understand that what's going on in Japan is there's a major burp radiation that's coming here, and I've got a report that five out of seven Fukushima babies born with, have birth defects, <gasps> Down oh, syndrome, or miscarried. Yeah. Uh, and people don't yeah, understand. I that too, yeah. That. yeah, yeah. People need to understand that. Now, you're a nuclear yeah. expert, Chris. And you see this happening. I've been uh, trying for now a month to chase uh, Senator Wyden's assistant, uh, Mary Gautreau, and I can give that phone number if people want to get to contact her. Her number is 503-326-7525, and you need to harass her, too, to say, Contact Dr. Deagle. I'm the keynote speaker now for the Academy of Environmental Medicine, first week in October in St. Petersburg, Florida. 
I'm going to present to the Academy the data of what's going on and what's likely to happen. This is the biggest environmental disaster, and it's on top of the Macondo British Petroleum Disaster, which also has Corexit 9500, with petroleum distillates to dissolve the myelin sheaths and mem membranes, cause neurotransmitter problems, and cortical atrophy in people. The combination of radiation toxicity with uh, cesium, which also causes toxicity to the brain, seizures, and neural uh, decay. And when you put oxidative stress, you basically make people decorticate and decerebrate, affecting the higher metabolic areas of the frontal lobes first and the areas of the association cortex for speech and language and communication. So we're going to start seeing yeah. much more bizarre behavior as the radiation level gets higher, and the amount of birth defects is going to go right through the ceiling. But let, let me just uh, bring up uh, Unit 4, Fukushima Spent Fuel Pool, if, if I can, just for a minute. Uh, they yes. are trying to, they announced it today, that they're going to try to move some of the fuel. They are concerned about the seawater. Remember, we talked about salt right. water and, and the corrosive it's, effect. It's decroding it, yeah. And, you know, whether they listen to us or we were just thinking the same lines, you know, they're, now they've stepped up their efforts to try to remove the fuel, and they're going to take a test run on it, put it into a container. I'd love to see what this container looks like because if, if, if it's any of the hotter, newer fuel assembly, it's going to need some sort of a coolant in it. Right. And uh, they're going to use two cranes and they're going to somehow uh, uh, coordinate this particular pick. It's a, a move. We call it a pick. A pick, you know, a, a, a pick it up. But uh, they need to move this to another storage facility, and they're very concerned about what the salt water has been doing to this and whether they can actually well, even put it in a larger pool. Remember, they also have that, that waste mm -hmm. reprocessing facility. So, you know, yeah. th this is, this is going to be a pretty uh, arduous task. And, well, these, uh, these, these also, fuel raw pellets are inside of bundle arrays. And if the fuel raw pellets have agglomerated and the bundle arrays have actually been twisted by the debris and the things that have happened there, they're not likely to come out smoothly, which means they're going to either fall apart because of neutron annealing, or they're actually so bent that they're not going to come out uh, as a single bundle array, and you may end up having to take out huge chunks of these all together. So it's a great okay. big uh, mess. This is not like re this is not like taking normal fuel rod assemblies out by just popping them out and then sticking them in another uh, area. And they're concerned that if this goes, it's going to pop. And the fact is, they lost the non-interruptible power supply. It's virtual guarantee that sometime this uh, this uh, seal. And you talked about this in several reports that were they took this show and they brought it over when I was gone on the 14th of June and again on the 21st on E N E News and they put the audio up. But I want you to repeat this, Chris, so people really grasp it. When the fuel, when the seal goes in that reactor, no amount of pumping or uninterruptible power supplies or anything will stop it from them going critical. And then when those fuel rod assembly bundles go, the minimum radiation, and you quoted this back, I think it's, what was the name of the scientist in April that reported it? Was, it was Dr. Gailey. Dr. Gailey, and you reported it, and we have that report posted up in the PDF. Gailey's report showed that the radiation level will be 30 to 100 times more if only 10% of these fuel rod assemblies blow their, their cork. So we're dealing with a radiation release that's so massive, it'll make any work in the entire area impossible, and that radiation burp will come to North America, and we're going to start seeing more and more burst defects, more premature yeah. babies dead, more senior citizens weakened, more plagues likely, also the death of birds, butterflies, and other insects, because many of these animals and birds and butterflies are very radio sensitive. The only things that are not are things like cockroaches. You can well, in my mind, this just, just, just confirms what we've been discussing before because they're obviously concerned. They were going to start this operation in 2014, and now they've stepped it up to like yeah. soon. If so, you live, by okay, the way, in California, contact, report, I just contact, Diane, contact Diane Feinstein's office, too. Again, Senator Feinstein's involved with that mission. Her San Diego office is 619 231 nine seven one two and her office in washington dc is two oh two 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 four three eight one four we need a you know the ones that even showed some concern we need to continue to harass them so that they deal with these issues of getting data as i recommended from uh, commercial airliners and then getting an international military and nuclear mission to actually contain this mess before it comes here on mass <laughs> 